YouTube, Myron Golden here, and I am here to do a video on Proverbs, how to be wise beyond your size. I don't know about you, but I know that I've felt like in the past that like the thing that I have to do, my mission is bigger than me. And if you ever felt like your mission is bigger than you, how can you, how can you even learn how? How can you become the person who can do the thing that so, feels so much bigger than your current capability? So how do you be wise? How do you be wise beyond your size? It's really interesting. King Solomon was the wisest, wealthiest man who ever lived, and he wrote a book called Proverbs. And the word Proverbs means sayings, right? And so I want to talk to you about some Proverbs that are really cool that I read when I was a kid. They used to make me scratch my head like, what in the world is he talking about? What, is, what does this mean? So I'm going to read it to you, and so you see if it makes sense to you. Because when I read it, I was like, I don't know what this guy's talking about. And, and through study and meditation on the passage, I figured out what it meant. So Proverbs chapter 30, verse 24 uh, King Solomon, wisest man who ever lived, if he were alive today, the money he had, he'd be worth like multiple trillions of dollars. Okay, here's what he said. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 24. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in the king's palaces. Now, I don't know about to you, but to me, that just sounds like, like when I first read that, this sounds like a bunch of unrelated facts, like, and, or like, so what? So before I delve into what he's talking about there, there are some great lessons for life, some great lessons for business. Let me help you understand one thing. We have to start out by understanding, it says, there will be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are wise um, that they are, but they are exceeding wise. In other words, they're very, they're small, but they have big wisdom, right? So before I do that, you have to understand that wisdom has some prerequisites, right? The word, the Old Testament word wisdom would be our modern day word skill. So some people wonder, like, Myron, why is your business called Skillionaire Enterprises? Because wisdom is skill. Most people think wisdom is high IQ. They think wisdom is intelligence. They think wisdom is um, education. They think wisdom is smart. That's not what wisdom is. Wisdom is skill. So I'm going to break down to you the prerequisites of wisdom, and then I'm going to tell you what wisdom is, and then I'm going to show you how to be wise beyond your size. So first of all, you have to understand the first prerequisite for wisdom. In fact, I'm going to write it on my board here. Prerequisite number one. Prerequisite number one is have a black marker. Okay, so prerequisite number one. Prerequisite number one. Um, prerequisite. So prerequisite means, prerequisite means a prerequirement, a requirement that you have to have beforehand. Okay, prerequisites of wisdom. First prerequisite of wisdom is ignorance. Right? So ignorance is a prerequisite of wisdom. What is ignorance? Ignorance is the absence of truth. So, man, I could just go into a big, long rant about truth, uh, but I'm not going to do that right now. So, so ignorance is the absence of truth. When I was born, I was ignorant. I didn't know my hand. I didn't know my left hand from my right hand. I didn't know my hand from my foot. I didn't know my ear from my eyes. I didn't know, I didn't know anything. When I, when I was born, I knew nothing, right? I didn't know anything about anything to know when I was first born, right? I didn't know my mom from my dad, hot from cold, wet water from like fire, I knew nothing. But as you grow, my mom probably came in one day and saw me going, looking at my hands slobbering all over myself. She's like, hand, that's your hand, baby. I said, hand, hand? She said, that's right, that's your hand. And I learned one word at a time. By the way, let me encourage you first and foremost, for those of you who are like believing for some crazy reason that there's something you can't learn how to do, just remember that when you landed on this planet, planet, however many years ago, you didn't know how to do anything. You couldn't walk, you couldn't talk, you couldn't go to the bathroom, you couldn't ride a bike, you couldn't use a phone, you couldn't use a computer. Just taking inventory of all the things you've already learned to do should let you know there's nothing you can't learn to do. So I hope that makes sense to you. So, so ignorance is the absence of truth. Next, the next prerequisite of wisdom is knowledge. Now, a lot of people think that the Bible uses the word knowledge sometimes and the word understanding sometimes and the word wisdom sometimes. Well, God doesn't want to sound redundant, so he just changes the word. No, the word knowledge is the accumulation of truth. So knowledge is the accumulation of truth. And by the way, while we're talking about truth, I will, I will go on one little Myron's my rant. 
and that is this. Everybody talking about your truth, my truth, his truth, her truth. There's no such thing as my truth and your truth and his truth and her truth. There's just the truth and anything that's not the truth is a lie. Now I know a lot of people don't like the way that sounds and I know it's not politically correct. I'm not running for office and I don't really care if you vote for me. I'm just here to share some things with you that'll take your life to another level. Okay, so so the truth is the truth, right? People say, I don't, I, that's your truth. I don't, that's not my truth. I believe I can fly and I'm gonna jump off the top of the Empire State Building and, and disprove the law of gravity. No, you're not gonna disprove the law of gravity, you're going to illustrate it. So the truth does not care about your ideas or your ideals, right? So knowledge is the accumulation of truth. And the more in line our understanding of truth is with actual truth, the safer our life really is. Okay. And if you think your life is safe by nobody warning you about all of the dangers around all of the corners and under all of the rocks, be that just because people don't like talking about them, you are in the greatest of dangers. Okay. So so knowledge is the accumulation of truth. And after knowledge, so here, and here's what I mean. Like I remember, I remember when I was in my 20s, there was this kid that taught me how to play a song on the piano. And then another kid taught me how to play two songs on the piano. So I could play three songs on the piano. I memorized where to put my fingers in what timing so I could play the songs on the piano. So I had the knowledge of how to play these songs on the piano, but I had no understanding of music. So you can have knowledge and not have understanding. Right? And if you have knowledge, you, know, no, you have no understanding, you might be able to do a thing because you saw somebody else do it, but you have no idea why it works. So the next thing, the, the next prerequisite of wisdom is called understanding. Understanding is the assimilation of truth. And assimilation of truth means I comprehend it. I make it a part of me. I understand how it works. So, like, knowledge is the accumulation of truth. I'm carrying, I'm, I'm, I'm collecting truths. I'm, I'm collecting all these different things about how life works. The sky is blue and the grass is green and the sun is in the sky. I'm collecting, I'm the collecting, accumulating the truth. Understanding is I'm assimilating it. I'm comprehending it. Oh, that's what that means. Oh, that's what that means. And that's what that means, right? So that's, and then lastly, is, or not lastly, yeah, the, the last one, then you finally get to have the thing we're talking about today, and that's wisdom. And wisdom is the application of truth. Application of truth. Now, when we say application of truth, the application of truth, now I'm doing the things that I know. I'm doing those things, they make sense to me. I'm like, oh, I get that, that makes sense, I'm gonna do that, right? So that is what wisdom is. Wisdom is the application of truth. I'm carrying out the truth that I've comprehended, that I've collected, now I'm wise. Now, if there is one more thing, it's the, it's the result of ignoring the truth, right? So, like, if you abandon the truth, that's called, number five, would be foolishness. Like you are a fool, what's a fool? Someone who abandons the truth, okay? So when you abandon the truth, now you're a fool. Now, those are the prerequisites. So now you understand what this thing is we're looking for. If I wanna, have, if I wanna have, uh, be wise beyond my size, I wanna do something that's bigger, I wanna do something tomorrow that's bigger than I am today. I wanna be wise beyond my size. I wanna produce results that maybe I don't have a degree for. I wanna produce results that maybe I don't have any experience in. How do I become wise beyond my size? That's what this passage is that I just read to you in Proverbs um, a while ago. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. What are they? First, um, the ants, um, verse 24, uh, the ants are a people not strong, verse 25, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. So the first thing we learn, we learn the wisdom of contemplation from the ant. Why? Because they know how to prepare. An ant, the, it's, it's saying like the ant knows how to see what's happening, going to happen in the future and they prepare themselves for it today. They don't say, they don't show up tomorrow and everything's going haywire and they're saying, wow, I didn't, well, what do you know about that? I didn't know that was going to happen. And ants are people not strong, but they prepare their meat in the summer. So we learn the wisdom of contemplation from the ant. So if you study the ant, what you're going to learn is you're going to learn how to prepare for what's next. And it's so interesting that so many people live as if today is just going to be Groundhog Day and it's going to be just like yesterday. And they make no preparations for tomorrow. But I heard somebody say one time, and I wish I could remember who said it. Somebody said one time that, um, that you better spend some time preparing for tomorrow because you're going to spend the rest of your life there. Are y'all tracking? So, so, so the answer are people not strong. They prepare the meat in the summer. So what, what, what do we learn about the ant? Well, if we go back to Proverbs chapter six, it says, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide or overseer or ruler, 
provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth, gathereth her food in the harvest. What is that telling us about an ant? Here's what it says. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Don't be lazy. Be diligent like an ant. You will never see an ant on a coffee break. You'll never see an ant on vacation. You'll never see an ant taking a nap. Ants are always moving, right? They're always figuring out how to get the deal done. And I don't know what it is about we humans, but we get a little bit ahead and we want to take a break that lasts forever. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so, so what you've got to do is you've got to get yourself to the place where you are diligent like an ant. So go to the ant thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Okay, what, what, what ways should I consider? Which having no guide, which means an ant is self-taught. An ant is not going to wait for you to come by and teach them. They're not going to wait for you to come by and read the book to them. The ant's going to go to the library and get the book. The ant's going to go to the person who has an attitude like an ant is going to go to the library and get a book. Obviously, ants are not checking out books at the library. Okay, so the ant's going to, the person who has the attitude of an ant's going to get, they're going to get the book. They're going to buy the lessons. They're going to do, they're going to do whatever it takes to learn the thing that's going to take their life to the next level, which having no guide, an ant is self-taught. They're having no overseer. An ant is self-motivated. They don't need somebody to crack the whip. They don't need somebody to wake them up. They don't need somebody to come to, to give them an inspirational speech every day. An ant does what they're supposed to do because they're, in, they're already motivated. Their motivation comes from the inside out. It doesn't come from the outside in. They have no guide. They have no overseer. They have no ruler. We know also that an ant, the wisdom of an ant is that an ant is uh, self-discipline. What does that mean? That means they do what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it, the way they're supposed to do it. Watch this now. And they do it that way every time they do it. So, so that's the first one. The ants are people not strong, but they prepare their meat in the summer. So we learn the wisdom of contemplation from the ant. The other thing we see about the ant that's very different than human beings, ants think positive when things are negative, but ants think negative when things are positive. You know what we as humans do? We think negative when things are negative and positive when things are negative, positive, right? But the ant thinks summer all winter. The ant is thinking positive when things are negative. Like he's down below the ground, maybe three feet. He's got six feet of snow above him if he's up north, right? So that's like 12 feet between him and the sunshine. And the ant's thinking, well, yeah, the snow's up there, but it's going to melt eventually. And eventually, it's, the sun's going to come out, and I'm going to be able to go up above the ground, right? So an ant thinks winter all summer, but an ant also thinks summer all wi thinks winter all summer. So when the things are going good, ants are saying, winter's coming, winter's coming, winter's coming. I got to get ready. Winter's coming, winter's coming. And so when things are going good, you should be making preparation for the season when things are not going to be going as good. So that's the first one. We learned the wisdom of contemplation from the ant. What's the second one? The second one is um, the conies are a feeble folk yet they make their houses in the rock. What is a coney? A coney is a rock badger. And when we were in Israel, we saw these rock badgers. And these, these, we, had the, we saw these, these uh, rock mountains. They were mountains that were made out of rock. And they had holes in them. And you see these little rock badgers going in and out of here. And it says the, the, the conies, the rock badgers, are a feeble folk, but they make their houses in the rock. What does that mean? They don't have a way to protect themselves. So what do they do? We learn the wisdom of compensation from the coney because they know how to protect themselves with things that are stronger than they are. They're like, okay, well, I, I can't protect myself against a wolf but, I, wolf, but I can go into this. I can go into this hole, and the wolf can't get me. I can't protect myself against the lion, but I can go into this hole, and the lion, and the lion can't get me. I can't, I can't protect myself from a tiger, but I can go into this hole, and the tiger can't get me. So they learn how to protect themselves with things that are stronger than they are. And when we learn the wisdom of compensation, what we'll do in our businesses is we will hire people who are good at what we're bad at. We won't just surround ourselves with a bunch of people who are just like us, right? When we, when we understand the wisdom of the coney, we'll get in a relationship, a husband or a wife, with a person who is, compliments us, not somebody who's just like us, not somebody who's a copycat of us. And so what we want to do is we want to we wanna surround ourselves with people who are strong when, where we're weak, who are good at what we're bad at, who play at what we work at. We want to surround ourselves with, um, with compensation. You want to have, you want to have, you want to have preparation, you want to have contemplation, you want to have compensation, you want to protect yourself with things that are stronger than you are. Okay, you, you guys get it. And then the next one is the locust have no king, yet they go forth all of them by bands. So what do we learn from the locust? Here's what we learn from the locust. We learn the wisdom of cooperation from the locust because they all participate. This whole, I'm, I did it my way, this whole, I just, I, I, it's the Myron show. I don't want it to be the Myron show. Like particip participation is the name of the game. Teamwork makes the dream work. Together, all of us, everyone achieves more. There's no such thing as a self-made millionaire. There's only team-made millionaires. There's no such thing as a self-made champion. There are only team-made champions. And you've got to learn how to participate and cooperate and be a part, be a part of, be a part 
of the greater whole. Like, if you got a team, like, when the team moves, you move, right? If you're a part of a church, when the church is doing something, you're doing something. If you're a part of a family, when the family's having to get together, you show up. Like, become one of the team. Together, everyone achieves more. And then the last one, which is really the most, seemingly the most confusing one of them all, it says, a spider taketh hold with her hands and is in the king's palaces. What does that mean? What that means is um, we, learn the wisdom of comp- we learn the wisdom of compensation from the spider because they know how to profit from what others have done. See, a spider can't build a palace, but a spider can live in one. And see, what spiders are, are I, said, I said compensation, I meant the wisdom of capitalization. We learn the wisdom of capitalization from the spider because the spider knows how to capitalize on what somebody else has done. A spider can't build a palace, but a spider can live in one. See, what, is, what does that look like for us? I can't invent the internet. Al Gore already did that, right? I'm, that's a joke, okay? I can't invent the internet, right? Somebody already did that, but I can capitalize on the fact that the internet exists. I didn't develop click funnels, but I can capitalize on the fact that Russell Brunson's team, they created click funnels. Right? I don't have to be the, the chief cook and bottle washer, the one who figured out how to do everything and the one who knows how to do everything. I know how to capitalize on what other people have done. And by the way, in the partnership age, one of the most valuable, like all of this stuff, can you see how it all fits hand in glove? And so the way you become wise beyond your size is to apply the wisdom of contemplation from the, from the ant, they know how to prepare. The second one, the wisdom of compensation from the rock badger because they know how to protect themselves with things that are stronger than they are. We learn the wisdom of cooperation from the locusts in that they all participate and we learn the wisdom of capitalization from the spider because they know how to par- they know how to profit from what others have done. If you will apply these things to your life, you will be wise beyond your size. That's the proverb for today. I hope it helps you. Make sure you like, comment, share this video and um, and thank you for watching. And we'll see you on the next video.